there's something pretty powerful to vulnerability. You're vulnerable. You're saying, let me meet you where you are. I see you. I was just like you. And you are not disqualified. In fact, you're most qualified to help the person you used to be. Anyone out there listening right now who feels like you've self-selected out because you don't have what it takes to achieve your true purpose, I don't believe that's true. I just think no one's taught you how to do it. We are terrible at anticipating what will go wrong. We're great at being able to handle it when our back is against the wall. What pain and suffering and aggravation would I not be willing to subject myself to in order to reach somebody out there who doesn't have a parent or support system or self-esteem and make them believe that they can pursue their true purpose? It's a waste of mental energy to revisit the things we already did. And that revisiting of the decisions we've already made because we didn't process risk is enough energy leakage to go ahead and make you never ever able to achieve your plan. I don't want to heal over some of these things because that's the gift. Yeah. The pain is the gift and I don't want to get over it. I do think the joy of living is in the striving. That we don't know exactly why we're here or where we're going and we seek out what's the ceiling on my potential yeah. and that's what brings us joy. I think the greatest breakthroughs are within our self-control and we tend to outsource our judgment to TED Talks and you know my book when the first stop should be you. Hey, welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm so grateful to have this man here today because of the timing of his visit in the economy, in the world. Um, I have found him over time to be one of the brightest business minds in the entire personal development space. And when he first reached out to me and he had reached out to me to come on the show, I said, let me just really look into him. I'd seen him before. I'd seen him on Shark Tank. I knew a little bit about him. And the more I dug into his work and his background, the more impressed I became and the more I was really hoping to be able to share his wisdom with the millions of people who listen and watch the show. And so he's a co-founder of RSE Ventures. He's got a book out right now that I love called Burn the Boats, Toss Plan B Overboard and Unleash Your Full Potential. This guy dropped out of high school. Now he's a fellow at Harvard Business School. His background's incredible. He's helped run the business side of the Jets before and the Miami Dolphins, and he's been successful in investing in many different businesses. And so the timing is perfect for Matt Higgins. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. High praise, Captain. Thank you. Oh, it's good to have you. I want to start out not on the book. I want to start out on the economy, if we could. Mm -hmm. I've watched you on some TV shows recently, and I want to know where you think we are. So many of my listeners and watchers are worried right now. They're starting to hear rumblings like this could be. Tony Robbins, for example, was on and said, I think we're going to be in an 8- to 10-year winter. And we've had some banks fail recently. There's just some stuff starting to brew. The dollar and some stuff happening with Saudi Arabia debating whether they're going to stay on the U.S. dollar. and the stuff going on in China. Where are we right now in your mind? Yeah, it's great. I, I feel like I've been Dr. Doom, uh, you know, going on interviews uh, a little bit early on CNBC, CNN, it's feeling like nobody's leveling with the American public because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who have a vested interest in the consumer to continue spending. Yes. And because 70% of our GDP is consumer spending. Mm -hmm. And so once the consumer puts their credit card away, everything begins to unravel. And yet at the same time, if you're in middle America and you're being told by the White House or Wall Street that it's going to be a soft landing, which is a euphemism for soft peddling, mm -hmm. it's to keep you spending. And I think we are under a mountain of debt right now, mm -hmm. and it has to be reckoned. And that is going to unwind over the next, I don't think it's six years. I think it's the next you know, 18 months. Okay. I think it actually will be relatively violent. Let's just do the math. The Fed's already said that unemployment, they believe, will get to 4.4% mm. by the fall. That's a million people. Mm. Most economists and experts believe in order to get inflation to, uh, to 2%, which is a stated goal, that we have to take unemployment to 6 to 7%. Mm. That means another 5 million Americans are going to lose their job in the next 12 to 18 months. Mm. And so the bottom line, my message to everyone is saying, put away the credit card. You know, uh, do what the private equity firms are telling their portfolio companies, hoard cash, mm -hmm. right? Stop spending, make provisions, because you never know if you're going to end up being one of those 5 million people. I don't think it takes six years, though. I think there's going to be a massive deleveraging event with banks, with companies, corporate debt. And once that happens, which will happen pretty fast, mm -hmm. then we can get out the other side. Mm -hmm. The moral of the story, Ed, as you know, free money is never free. Yeah. Five million of five trillion of stimulus money is now being washed uh, through the system. Yeah. So, in addition to being conservative with your money and not spending right now, and by the way, I'm so happy to hear that you say this because I don't go out that much, but when I do, I've been shocked at how crowded the malls are on the weekends, and I'm like, does everyone understand what's happening right now? Right? Doesn't like, it feel that way? It's yes. like it's like those tsunami videos where the water's coming yeah. in at the shore, and you're saying this is probably pretty bad, mm -hmm. and people, for whatever reason, are not getting the message. 
I think it's probably what you said, that there's a gigantic incentive to get people to continue to spend money. And really, no one's been punished for doing it for the last eight or 10 years. So why would they be punished coming forward? Yeah. Is it because they think, right. even though we both know something's brewing? And also, you know, I worry a lot about the housing market right now. Yeah, too. I think I think the housing market in particular. I get asked this a lot, too. What do you think of housing? Housing's held up. Do you remember the last crisis when the brokers were, were always saying, this neighborhood's different. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's like yes, yes. I feel like the entire banking industry is like this country and time is different. Mm -hmm. The reason the housing market is held up is because there's been no selling pressure and no incentive. I, you know, you're probably saying, well, I locked in crazy rates mm -hmm. uh, under these terms that you would have to pry me out of my house right. in order to sell it. So if you're a typical American where 99% have a, a mortgage rate that's lower than the prevailing rate, there's no reason to sell because you can't trade up because you're carrying costs. But once those layoffs start happening, the 1 million to 5 million people, they will have to sell their house. And that's where housing corrects, in my opinion, 10, 10 to 15% from here. Okay, good. I, uh, I'm not allowed to say what I think because I'm licensed, but I can, I'm in, in securities and insurance. Well, can However, you wink maybe? No, I can wink. <laughs> I, can, I can blink you if can I blink. agree with you. So <laughs> yeah. now listen, let's talk a little bit about how we men equip ourselves to be successful at any time in the world. That's one of the reasons I like burn the boats so much. So it's different than what you would think when you say burn the boats. It doesn't necessarily mean like abandon everything in your life to do one thing. It's almost a metaphor for burning the things in your life that may be holding you back to some extent, right? And so in your case, why'd you write the book, number one? And number two, I know the answer to this, but I want you to share it. What was the boat you needed to be burning? Yeah, no, great. It, it is a degree of a Trojan horse. Maybe I'm too clever for my own good. But the reality is uh, I wrote this book for the angst-ridden, uh, those with anxiety, who who self-select themselves out of this idea of full commitment mm -hmm. because they think it's not for me. It's not for going all in. So I want to appropriate this phrase and we can get into the history if you want. Sure. I want to appropriate this phrase that goes, that's the OG life hack that goes back to the beginning of recorded history. This idea of, of sabotaging your own escape that mm -hmm. military leaders intuitively understood is what's the best way to get the most out of us. I wanted to take that jingoistic term mm -hmm. and use it for everyone else mm -hmm. who maybe doesn't have a support system or yeah. infrastructure around them to teach them how to be fully committed to your goals. So mm -hmm. I do think the, the book is leading you to believe one thing, and then you pick it up and yeah. realize it's entirely different. It's entirely different. Yeah. But in your case, it's very different than what I expected. Like, what? give them an example of the boat you needed yeah. to burn. All right. So, so on the boat, this picture, which could look like a pagan symbol depending mm -hmm. on how you see it, right. but in reality, it's a paper boat floating mm -hmm. in, a, in a child's bathtub. So my boat, my metaphorical boat that I needed to burn were the legacy issues that were a hangover from childhood. Mm -hmm. And I could give you a little bit of context of that. Please. Yeah. I grew up in uh, Queens, New York, and uh, really tough circumstances, abject poverty. Those, lo those words lose their meaning, so you have to explain, what does that mean? You know, we'd eat government cheese. My mother would take us on a bus to go to an hour away to a church to get food so that the neighbors wouldn't see us. Mm -hmm. So my whole uh, early childhood was shame. And then um, defiance. So from an early age, I would sell flowers on street corners. I was that little kid knocking on your door, you know, yeah. trying to guilt you into uh, buying flowers for your wife on Valentine's Day and scraping gum under tables at McDonald's. So my, my, my context was poverty, was uh, no cavalry coming, mm -hmm. constantly frustrated. Like, is, why isn't the system set up to do something? Mm -hmm. My mother deteriorating physically. She was uh, obese but brilliant mm -hmm. and had no education. And I watched her go uh, leave my father, raise kids in squalor, but still aspire for something better, get a GED, and go to college. So there was this convergence of all those variables happening. Mm -hmm. And around you know, 14, 13, 14, I found myself increasingly desperate, frustrated, becoming self-destructive, mm -hmm. not for any particular because I didn't want to be here, but because I didn't want to be in charge. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why is no one coming to help? Mm -hmm. And then eventually, capitulation. It's on me. Yep. And I don't know where, thank God, the universe gave me this innate sense that I can take custody of my life. And I came up with a life hack, and I'll get to the, my, my burn the boats moment, which is I, I was making maybe three seventy five an hour at the time at McDonald's, five bucks an hour at a deli. And I would read these little ads in a newspaper, and it'd say, college students only, $8 an hour. And I was like, what is it about a college student that suddenly 2X is my income? But I was like, I have to have it. Yeah. I came up with this idea. What if I dropped out on purpose? And if you did well enough on the GED that you could go to college, because in a slightly condescending way, it's like, sh sh we, you know, we love redemption stories. Nobody ever yeah. chooses that yeah. path. And I remember so excitedly telling, you know, my guidance counselor, everyone, hey, I got a plan. I have a way out. You know, I'm going to get my GED. And of course, they said, you're going to be a loser. Mm. The entire system was set up to convince mm. me to stay the course. 
Now, I was hiding my true life. I never had a single person over my home until the day my mother died and they came and they took her body out. Mm -hmm. So no one knew the extreme deprivation and I was concealing it. Mm -hmm. And so my burn the boats moment came when I realized, how am I going to resist all this pressure to execute this plan that I know works for me, but that all of conventional wisdom is trying to talk me out of it? Mm -hmm. Police picking me up at McDonald's to bring me back to school, mm -hmm. guidance counselor calling. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the state collectively yeah. was trying to get me to stay the course, but not fix the problem. Mm -hmm. And then I realized sabotage. If I dropped out and failed every single, if I failed every single class and got left back for two years in a row, yeah. the system would transition from trying to make me conform to get rid of me. Mm. And that's what happened. So I hung out, I called it the land of misfit toys, me with the kids with the beepers and the drug dealers and you know, failing my classes, sleeping on the desk. I, I did typing because typing I thought would be useful. To this day, I type 100 words a minute. Dang. And then I had to execute. And I go into the book a little bit about how, because I don't want to glorify it. Like, look at me. I was full of doubt, anxiety. This is a crazy plan. Mm. But I executed, dropped out. And this is the most important lesson of my life. The look on the teacher's faces went from, derision and a judgment uh, and a shame to when I came back a year later as president of the debate team to my own prom. Wow. I remember going up to Mr. Rosenthal, who the day, last day of high school tells me, uh, I'll see you at McDonald's. What a waste. Did he really? Yep. And I told him as I walked out the door, uh, if you see me at McDonald's, it's because I own it. Now, in fairness to Mr. Rosenthal, <laughs> now in fairness to Mr. Rosenthal, statistically probably a pretty good projection. Mm -hmm. But I came back as president of the debate team. And the look on all their faces was begrudging admiration. Yeah. And it was like, I, I tell this story always because it contextualizes and encom you know, encompasses everything about this book, right? Mm -hmm. how, to, how to strengthen your conviction against the weight of conventional thinking, how to put yourself in a position that you have no other alternative, how society responds when they wish to put you back in that box, how the input you get from people is corrupted when they don't have the full story because you're concealing it. Mm. So the metaphor that I've extended from the military context to here is the boats are all the things in our life that you so eloquently talk about, the, the, the prison of our own making, yeah. how to fully commit, which is beautiful, how to burn those things down. Yeah. And the book is written for anyone out there listening right now who feels like you've self-selected out because mm. you don't have what it takes to achieve your true purpose. Mm. And I don't believe that's true. I just think no one's taught you how to do it. It's very good. You know, you said something in there in the very beginning. This is a term I've not heard before, but I love. You said, take custody of your own life. And so many of us sort of surrender custody to, to conform, to just conform. Like, this is the direction I'm supposed to go. It's what everybody expects me to do. And it takes a lot of courage. And I'm watching you even as you speak. You know, your face breaks a little bit a couple different times. It's still an emotional thing for you. Oh, it's raw. And when you yeah. talk about it, I actually picture you as that little boy. I picture this little dude, like, wanting to be somebody, wanting to do something great. You know, everybody should remember one thing, you know, as Matt's talking. And we're going to go through some real detailed things now in a minute. But there's a lot of tests that can measure IQ. You can measure someone's height, their jumping ability, their speed. We can look at someone and determine whether or not they're you know, physically attractive. There's never been a test designed to measure somebody's heart, their will, their desire, that thing inside of us. And that's the thing that's invisible about you that when you're getting feedback or you're getting advice from people telling you what to do, they can't measure that. And they don't know that about you. And that's why most advice is not good advice because they don't know your heart. I've, similar story, everyone that's become successful has something similar in their life. And what they didn't know about me, what they didn't know about you was that will to win, that heart to overcome things and, and be resilient and overcome adversity and also make good decisions. And so there's something I was watching an interview you were in and because I do something similar and it surprised me because I think most people think successful people have this abundance of confidence. But you ask yourself, a, when you're about to make a difficult decision, right? Because it is a difficult decision to go, I'm going to make a career change. I'm going to leave this relationship I'm in. I'm going to start a part-time side hustle. I'm going to drop out of high school, right? These, these are difficult decisions. You kind of go through a series of questions with yourself that help you make the decision. And I think it's brilliant. So would you start by sharing that? No, I, I love that uh, setup because the book, I, I, when I wrote the book, I kept thinking, okay, what are the natural objections to the book, right? I, I knew a vast, you know, significant percentage of people would hear burn the boats and think that's risky, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, what if it doesn't work out? All mm -hmm. the things we say to ourselves. So, so I, I want to underscore for anyone listening, like I am the most paranoid risk taker you're ever going to meet. Mm -hmm. And burning the boats and fully committing to your true purpose does not mean you don't process risk. It's the opposite. It's actually you need to process risk at the beginning of the journey. So, okay. so my, my process, and I'll make it less abstract with the book itself, but it's fourfold, right? Number one, I ask myself, okay, 
what's the worst that will happen if I fail at mm. pursuing my true purpose, my plan A? Now, usually that answer is reputational. It helps me audit. I realize I'm worried about judgment. Yes. I also catastrophize that little boy never left that apartment. So I'm still worried that somehow all the money is going to get taken away mm. and I won't be able to take care of my kids. Mm. So it, it, it makes me confront that. That's mm. number one. And two, I try to put a, put a, put a probability on that. Mm. What, would, what would I do? If the worst thing were to happen, how would I mitigate it? Humans vastly underestimate our ability to respond to almost anything. We are terrible at anticipating what will go wrong. We're great at being able to handle it when our back is against the wall. So true. We, right? We, we, if I were in the beginning of the month, I've done this before. I put all the things on the left-hand column that I'm worried that are going to happen this yes. month. And man, my mind goes to terrible places. Mm -hmm. It's like if you were in my head, you'd be like, Matt. Mm -hmm. How are you not going to end up at landlord tenant mm -hmm. court? I was mm -hmm. like, you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm one bad decision away from mm -hmm. that happening. Mm -hmm. But I say, how would I mitigate this worst thing that I'm imagining? And then my third step is, let's put a percentage handicap on the likelihood that that might happen. Mm -hmm. Even my, my irrational brain knows that that's like a 2% remote mm -hmm. scenario, the worst thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is so important to me. And I keep all this very raw to me. I don't want to heal over some of these things mm -hmm. because that's the gift. Yeah. The pain is the gift. And I don't want to get over it. Mm -hmm. I said, so the last thing I said, what would I be willing to do to endure, to suffer through, to be able to achieve my plan A? Mm -hmm. So in the case of this book, what pain and suffering and aggravation or would I not be willing to subject myself to in order to reach somebody out there mm -hmm. who doesn't have a parent or support system or mm -hmm. self-esteem and make them believe that they can pursue their true purpose? Like That is almost breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And usually my whys are so grandiose teaching in Harvard Business School. How does a kid with a GT go to Crazy. end up at teaching in Harvard? What would I not do? And the answer is usually walk on glass, come within an inch of my life, mm -hmm. stay up straight for days, lose almost everything. Mm -hmm. And I think, and here's why that matters, uh, to make this less abstract for the, oh, those listening, when I, when I did the book, use an example, and now I fully committed to writing a great book and I was excited about the title, you know, but there were a couple of things I put in the book that I feel very uncomfortable with that are hard for me to read. And the biggest one is about my divorce. I did not want to put that in there. And it kept repeating on me like acid reflux. And I get a call from a magazine, excitedly. We love the book. We want to do an excerpt. Yay, great. We want to do the, the section on divorce. Ugh, uh. That one sec. So, so then I, I, rather than follow the own advice in the book, I revisited all the anxiety about why I didn't want to put it in there. Now, when I, before I wrote it, the reason I did it is I was feeling so desperate and alone in a really dark place when I was going through it. And I know that if I wrote it a certain way, somebody out there who was going through that would read that, that paragraph and feel like how they had been seen. Yeah. And so I had already did my four-step process before I wrote the book. Now, the book was already at the publisher. Mm. I didn't let them publish the reprint. So let's talk about consequences of me not following my own advice of being all in on, on, on burning the boats, right? Mm. I do an interview and I talk about some of the themes in a book. And I get a note from a guy. And he says, I just heard you talking openly about the book. Tonight is the first night I'm alone you know, with my kids. Mm. And I sent him a book. Mm. And, I, and I, I circled the page and I said, this page well, you know, was written for you. And he sent me a note saying, You're, you changed my life. Like yeah. you saw me. So look at your face right now. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so it's beautiful, brother. You should be very proud of that. So my point is, mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to be critical, not emotional. <laughs> I didn't let them run the reprint. I could have reached more people. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's what Burn the Boats is about. It's, yeah. it's a waste of mental energy to revisit the things we already did. And that revisiting of the decisions we've already made because we didn't process risk is enough energy leakage to go ahead and make you never, ever able to achieve your plan A. Mm. And so I like that little case study, and I need to be able to tell it without getting emotional. But it is a beautiful thing, right, Ed? Mm. I mean, you, you have enough wealth and mm. success. I don't need another accolade. Yeah. I want to use that, what I saw when I was 16, mm. and what I've been through to redistribute that knowledge. Great. And so that story of the guy you know, reaching me, I was like, oh, you're such an idiot. <laughs> Why did you let them run the excerpt? Well, the other thing you say in the book, I want you to talk about this a little further. You say, turn your deepest flaws into your most astonishing triumphs. And I found, like, for me, like, you know, there's this tendency to want to just impress people all the time. And I don't think you connect with anybody when you impress them. Um, John Maxwell said this to me many, many years ago. He said, you know, Ed, if you really want to impress people, tell them how perfect you are. But if you want to connect with people, reveal to them your imperfections. And I think there's this stuff in our culture right now where the things, I say this often lately, probably too much, but. We think these things disqualify us, our mistakes, our divorce, our bankruptcy, our sins, our averageness, our invisibleness over our lifetime. 
we think, ah, because of those things, I'm disqualified from a future that's different. And the truth is, ironically, maybe the pathway to getting there isn't to revisit them necessarily, because I agree with you on that. But there's something pretty powerful to vulnerability. Like I can guarantee you out of this entire interview, the part that people are going to be the most moved by is what just happened. Mm. Because you are, you're vulnerable. You're saying, let me meet you where you are. I see you. I was just like you. And, and you are not disqualified. In fact, you're most qualified to help the person you used to be in your life. And so what do you mean when you say turn your deepest flaws into your most astonishing triumphs? What does that mean? Yeah, so uh, 100% agree with you about the sharing of the vulnerabilities, what creates space for mm -hmm. self-awareness. People always ask me, Matt, you talk so much about how self-awareness is the greatest arbitrage in mm -hmm. personal and professional life, but how do you cultivate it? Mm -hmm. I say you cultivate it by modeling it. Yes. Right. Like you model the vulnerability and mm. then others. Now either you're a sociopath. You won't meet me. Right. Or you're a real human. And you're you're think, oh, thank you. Give mm. me give me a relief. So I, I talk to students at a homeless shelter who are getting their GED. So imagine mm. being in a homeless shelter and you're trying to get a GED when you have no infrastructure. Right. And when I walk in the room, they you know, and I always ask this question. I said, so, you know, what do you think about me? What do you perceive? And they're like, yeah, you, you're loaded. You got a plane, probably. Mm. Look at your suits. You know, you're mm. a white guy, grew up, went to Harvard and all that. And then I tell the story in the non airbrushed version that is not in the book. Mm. And they get the real, they get the full story. Mm. And, you know, kids end up crying mm. or, or saying, and I said, okay, now let me tell you something really excited. Everyone likes to feel good about themselves. And they love to do right by somebody who overcame hard circumstances. Mm. You're getting a GD in a homeless shelter. That is like a weapon of mass destruction. Yes. That will make people admire you for the rest of your life. You feel like the die is cast. And I'm telling you, you're sitting on such an incredible asset. You just need to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. That I, Fortunately, I'm, I think you feel the same way. I, I don't have any problem talking about it. The only mm -hmm. problem I have talking about these things is I keep them raw so that yeah. they are useful. I don't want to like... I don't want to package it so that they lose their power because I think that's why when we read Instagram posts that say failure is great, like, okay, but what does that really mean? Right. Well, let me show you. Let mm -hmm. me show you what bleeding out looks like. Yeah. When I tell those kids that story, their framing goes from one of feeling like they are less than or discarded yeah. to one of feeling like it is an asset because I'm is. able to make them understand. And I think it gives you a level of belief. Um, even me listening to you, and I'm already 52 years old and have had some decent stuff happen in my own <laughs> yeah. life, right? But any time I ever hear somebody's stories about what they've had to go through to get where they are, it frankly, in an odd way, alleviates my worrying and anxiety about where I currently am. Because at any given time in your life, no matter who you are, you're doing it today. I guarantee you there's something on your mind today. No question. That you're like, I'm really worried about this. I have anxiety about this. I think people think that, man, if I can get to a certain point, those things sort of dissipate. I'm going to let you both in. There's two very wealthy men talking to each other right now. Let's, let's be real for yeah. a minute. I drove here today, and I had a two-hour drive here to the studio today. It was a long drive. I was excited to interview you. I have a couple other interviews today. But in all candor, I spent the majority of my time processing a problem I have right now. I'm processing it. And what helped me process that problem was two things. One, I actually prepped for this interview, and I was l reading about some of the things you've been through. And then me reflecting on other places I've been in my life. And I do just what you do. I have that same process. What's the likelihood of this happening? If it happens, what would I do, et cetera, et cetera? How bad would it really be? But I think it's important for people to know. You're worth several hundred million dollars. So am I. Do you still have problems and things you worry about and anxiety and fears? And, and they're just probably as pronounced as they were when you were younger, I would imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it's endless. And, in, mm. and for a bit, I would judge the presence of them as an indication that I'm not evolved or I would condemn myself. Like, mm. when are you ever going to feel, yes. you know, that you got it under control? And the answer I realized is never because I am constantly putting myself in uncomfortable positions. Yes. You know what I mean? Well, wouldn't <laughs> but, you worry? I'd have to interrupt you. No, please. I would worry. This is so weird. I keep using the word worry. I should stop that. I would have concern. <laughs> If I didn't have concerns. Right, you were complacent then. Like, I'd be like, what am I, there's nothing vibrating around me. There's no frequency. There's no expansion happening. There's no growth happening. I, I, the presence of some level of anxiety. Now, having, like you teach in the book and I teach in my work, tactics and tools and strategies to deal with these things and flourish when they happen is important. But when I was young, I thought, I'm going to get to a point in my life when I have enough money and good enough friends and this or that, that I won't have worries or anxiety anymore. And I think that's the picture the world sort of paints for us. And never in any interview have I said this out loud. It's just with you. 
I just realized that driving out here today, this is not going to end. <laughs> right. This I'm is 52 a, this is years old. a different this, kind of prison of our own making. It's <laughs> a different prison of my own mind. And it's, but by the way, I like the escape. I enjoy the escape from the prison. It's okay for me in my life to have issues and problems. I rather enjoy the escape from the prison. And then just, I just have finally surrendered the false belief system that there won't be another one eventually present itself in my life. I just want you to acknowledge that because you people look at you like Shark Tank, Harvard, you know, different football yeah. teams, you know, a lot of really well-known people admire and respect you. It's just going to be there, right? And it's having the tactics and strategies to deal with it when it appears. No, it, it, it's so funny. We're talking about this. Like, it's never ending. It's every day. It's almost like the movie Fifty First Dates. I'm like, we're going to do this again, <laughs> and, and, and and it's always a cons- constant refrain of like, this time it'll be clear to everyone that there were other times were bullshit too. Yeah, there's a little bit of like, yeah. and then I went, then when I audit, I'm like, oh well, this is a painful, hard fact pattern that most people would never be able to engineer, nor would they try. Mm-hmm. And then every time I I indulge myself in a new version of my life, like you know what though, I'm gonna. Reap the rewards. It's time for the harvest, you yeah, know. And right. I, and that lasts about forty eight hours. And actually, I realized that is an is a as a feedback loop of saying you need a little healing, mm-hmm. like you're taking it to the edge. Me too. But 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 the premise of the book, I, I'm glad we're talking about this. Because I wondered, is this my confirmation bias? I do think the joy of living is in the striving. That we don't know exactly why we're here or where we're going, and mm-hmm. we seek out. What's the ceiling on my potential? Yeah. And that's what brings us joy. It's why marathon runners feel melancholy afterwards mm-hmm. and Olympians have depression. It's because we, we enjoy the training and we enjoy the pursuit. But I, we don't talk about that a lot. And we don't w- kind of coach each other about how to say, all right, well, how do we endure mm-hmm. in, the, in the life of perpetual pursuit? You're, here's how right you are. I, lo- I love where we're going with this here today. Me too. Because I have to tell you, um, and, and Andrew Huberman, I think you know who Andrew well, of course, is. Okay. Yeah. Andrew and I were talking, and one of the things he shared with me is he said they've actually proven that the dopamine hit is actually greater in the pursuit of the goal than the actual moment of achievement. That the, the, the benefit in our brains, that great feeling that we get, is actually higher and in greater abundance in the pursuit and the journey of the goal or the achievement or the moment or the date or the whatever than it is when we actually get it. And there's actually a perpetual precipitous drop off after the achievement, which is why a lot of times when we achieve things like, ah, it's not what I thought it would be. It actually was. You just have to reflect on the pursuit of it. That's the cumulative you... effect of those little wins. Right. It's funny. You say, I, I feel much more boosted by the little breakthroughs when I've lost hope on doing something. I'm going through something now. And it was like I had a breakthrough. I'm like, wow, this is some of my finest work. And of course, that'll fade within 48 hours. But, yes. but I have actually come to accept that that premise that mm. at the end of this, I will not feel that big payoff. Mm. I do wonder where joy and celebration fits in. I don't think I have that fully calibrated. I don't People, think anybody does. I, yeah. I think I'm much further along than I used to be. I actually really work on celebrating. And the reason is, is that I want to convince my neurochemistry, frankly, that this is worth doing again. How do you do it? I'd love life hacks because I, I, even with the book on the way here, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I haven't experienced the joy of having a book in an airport. And I used to fantasize about this moment, and yet I haven't done it. So I went in the book, and I waited for somebody to walk by the section. It was a woman, and she slowed enough. I said, hey, do you read these kinds of books? And she said, I never would bother reading these books. I'm like, okay, let's do it. She's like, well, I read Atomic Habits. I'm like, hey, you might want to buy it. I go to her and say, can I buy you my book? That's and so she said, beautiful. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, I, and then she asked me where I'm from. She's from the same neighborhood. Oh, see. She, she's my neighbor. And I'm like, this must be That's the universe trying to reinforce the attempt. But how do you experience joy? Well, my experience of joy is very similar to what you just said. For some reason, for me, it's the reflection in other human beings, eyes, hearts, messages, et cetera. I allow myself to accept those compliments now. Whereas before, I'm like, yes, thank you, but you don't know I could have done better. And so I would rob myself from the, I could have done better thing. And now I accept that what I did was the best I could do in that moment. And I allow myself to feel uh, the embrace from other people. I gain, I've learned in my life, I gain significance. I feel significant when I contribute to the lives of other people. So I found my recipe. So I don't rob myself from that. The other thing I do is I allow myself to celebrate. Now, they're not long windows of celebration. I'm not any good at that yet. But when <laughs> something great happens, I'm good at having a cigar or a bottle of wine or a dinner with people or saying, and wow, and reflecting for a moment. And I've, I've built that muscle of bliss. I talk about something called blissful dissatisfaction. People conflate bliss and hap- happiness and satisfaction. They think, oh, if I allow myself to have a bunch of happiness or bliss, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my drive. 
I'm going to lose the recipe. So because I've kept myself in misery all my life, if I just stay in misery, I'll keep achieving. I found not to be true. I've actually found that as I finally started to celebrate. So I do that with reflection. I do that with uh, receiving the gratitude from other people. Um, also for me, we talked before we came on about my faith. For me, every time it happens, just my personal thing is to go, just thank you, Lord. Like, I, man, you're working in my life again. So it's an acknowledgement that it's not just me and that I'm somehow glorifying a power greater than myself. For me, that's Jesus. For whatever, anybody listening to that, that's fine. I'm not here to convert you today. But what I am saying to you is that it's a, it's a validation of my faith that there's something greater in life than just me or just this time here. And that's really that, the deep that is That part, that last part, is the part that I've realized brings me a bliss. Mm-hmm. I'm always wondering, why do I like to be surrounded by a pain? Or, you know, I mm-hmm. can't handle small talk. And yet when somebody brings up, you know, pain or suffering, it, you know, I get animated. Mm-hmm. And I realized I, I like to be reminded about my smallness and the irrelevancy of, of all things. It's very peaceful. It is. And, and I had the most incredible experiences over the last uh, year and a half meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican. Whoa. Yeah, my, I, Whoa. I, these, these uh, um, private visits with the Pope to talk about refugees and human rights. And then I went to a refugee center in Italy, Whoa. and it was meeting with what I would believe are my versions of LeBron James, like a dad who would go through, you know, f- figuring out how to flee in a trunk of a car to give his family a better life. And I always look at refugees and migrants and think we ask, you know, why are they coming here instead of what are they running from? And, yeah. But I realized, what is it about me that takes such peace and joy of being around that because it reminds me that oh this just doesn't matter the mm-hmm. the stuff the accolades you know the attention yeah what really matters is alleviating suffering like you saw in that little apartment yeah in queens and so like i went to, when i went before i went to see the pope i was like i'm such a bad catholic i, I really feel like i need to unburden myself i said can you send an emissary for me so that i can do confession and I, like that was great and i was like but it needs to be really close like three steps from god you know like i have <laughs> I, I, need so someone that, high up. I need someone really high up and i meet with the, uh, I meet with the, it's in the book, but I meet with the, uh, the Scalabrinis are the order that takes care of refugees and migrants. And I was like, that will do. And they send the head, the head of uh, the head, Father Leonir to meet me in Little Italy. And we meet for three hours. It was like the books opened up. I mean, hmm. because when somebody is that high up in the church, they actually have PhDs and mm-hmm. it's all this collected wisdom. Mm-hmm. And I was unburdening myself. Tears are flowing. Sure. And I was like, you know, I don't agree with this. And mm-hmm. it's like, it's okay, my child. You were given free will. You know, it's like everything had the right Jedi answer. Mm-hmm. But then I was talking about the shame I was carrying. Mm-hmm. Uh, this isn't the book was just getting started. And I, and I was saying, I don't know how to deal with that. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know why I keep trying to he's like number one you're trying to go back and save your mother but the way to save your mother is to save those save others mm. you know what i mean and mm. but then also tells me the story of a, of a diamond ring it's like let me tell you a story of a diamond there was a diamond and it slipped off a of one's finger and it went into the sewer and for years there is where it remained covered in slu- sludge and mud until one day a little boy was playing in the street and his ball went down to that sewer and he saw it and him and his dad came out and they put a little you know hanger down they were able to bring it back up and it was dirty and whatever and they washed it off and there was a beautiful diamond. He's like, no matter how much sludge and mud we cover ourselves up, we were always a diamond. Yeah, and it was, good. so I had, is the point of that story is only, that's having so gone good. to the Vatican and spending time uh, around, when I'm not particularly religious, I realized, oh, I, I, I need to be reminded of the irrelevancy of all these other things. I want to stay in that place of a 16-year-old boy mm-hmm. who witnessed suffering and powerlessness, because that is more important than anything in my life, mm-hmm. any possession, and anything I'll ever do. So, but the achievement, having said all of that, yep. the achievement and the success gives you the platform to reach those right, people, right. and that's why it's important. And that's why sometimes people say, "Well, that means I don't have to achieve anything." Wrong. No, the authority. I say I'm collecting authority. The, the UB- book is just my resume is an incoherent collection of authority you know to reach it. people at disparate places. Oh, you admire people on TV? Well, I'm on Shark Tank. You nailed. You it. admire wealth? I have a lot of things. Yep. You admire sports? I ran a few of those. Yep. But I, 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 I truly mean it. It is a degree calculated mm-hmm. because not no one of these things particularly resonate, but collectively they give me the authority to rewind the clock. You're 100. You know percent And by the way, what you've discovered and I've discovered is whatever human being who finds some leisure of bliss uh, discovers is that you were put here to help contribute to the lives of other people. That's really why you were put here in your own very unique and beautiful way. And sometimes for achievers, we're the last to figure that out. We sometimes are. often it's people that work in a church or someone who's de- dedicated their life like my sister to being a school teacher she figured this out a lot sooner than i did and although i've got a lot more money than her she's had a lot more blissful moments and yeah. joyous moments in her life and so sometimes us achievers it takes us longer to figure it out however when we do we have a platform and a stage and a reach 
that can make an impact that's even more monumental. I went to I was with Warren Buffett once uh, at he he came to a Dolphins game and uh, I got to spend a whole day with him walking mm-hmm. around and I got to ask him about you know compounding interest and all mm-hmm. a lot of his views. But one of them I had asked him about um, how did he handle waiting until later in his life to make those big contributions to philanthropy. Yeah. And he told me, I took a lot of criticism for that. Mm. And, I, and I, I would struggle with it. But in my mind, I thought, going back to compounding, mm. that the ability for me to compound that money in my possession would mean that there would be a lot more of it to distribute mm. by the time I got to the end. Mm. I sort of thought that was fast, because yeah. I'm sure you feel this about accomplishment, right? I'm a human being. I have aspirations and ambitions. I want to keep playing with my capacity and my potential. So I want to keep creating. And then I want to also ameliorate suffering. And yeah. sometimes they can feel attention. Mm-hmm. So it's like what I've tried to say is I'm allowed to be intentional about my boundaries. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have to be a saint. Mm-hmm. But at the, and I'm still accumulating power and resources yeah. yes. while redistributing concurrently. Mm-hmm. And then it's okay, right? I yep. still Because you know how sometimes I always say, I'm not here to go on a rescue mission. Yeah. I'm here to make a trajectory change in your life. Very good. You know, a deposit. Very but, good. But don't ask me to take custody over you. you know, well, that... that the word custody is really powerful. And I'm going to use it after mm-hmm. today because I think a lot of times people are waiting for somebody to take custody over their life. They're waiting for the government to do it. Yep. They're waiting for one seminar they're going to go to or one book they read. And as good as my book is and as good as your book is, they still have to take custody of their lives. And and waiting for someone to come along and save you, you will be waiting until the day you die. That's true. And hopefully you've done well enough in your life that you are saved, having said all of that. Okay. Insight versus invention, since we're on this topic a little okay. bit. Um, you talk about that. And when does insight beat out invention? Mm. Uh, you mean proprietary insights yeah. and uh, yeah. well, I think mostly actually. <laughs> like mm-hmm. if I look at some of the be- the best businesses mm-hmm. that over the last you know twenty years, mm-hmm. think about Airbnb. Yeah. What is Airbnb other than a hundred billion dollar company, whatever it is right now? Airbnb is a guy who slept on a futon in two thousand nine. Was like you know I think the sharing economy is going to be a thing. I don't know how he came up with that yes. insight because I would have said everyone's going to steal everything. Mm-hmm. I think sharing economy is going to be good. Two, I think there are more people like me who feel this way, even mm-hmm. though they don't know it yet. So mm-hmm. I'm going to put a product in front of them, mm-hmm. and I'm going to build a business. Yep. That's a what I call a proprietary insight. It's, it's, it's an insight that you glean from the context of your life or your job that could be, one, a path to a better way to do something, mm-hmm. or a promotion, mm-hmm. or your own business. Mm-hmm. And so what I, the reason why I'm, I'm passionate about this topic is when you look at Shark Tank, America's world's favorite show in business, which I was lucky to be on, Everything is a patent or, a bill, or mostly an invention usually. Yes. And, and I think that causes people watching that saying, I don't have a good idea. Billion though. percent right. Right? And I think that's actually not the reality of the world. It's just Shark Tank isn't able to show the it. conceptual businesses. Like Airbnb couldn't have been on Shark Tank because mm-hmm. they would have laughed them off the stage. Yes. And so I, Uber I, couldn't have been on Shark no, Tank. No, Uber couldn't have been on Shark Tank. So I try to show people in the book, what does a proprietary insight look like? There's one great story in there, and uh, I'll make this mm-hmm. quick. Michelle Cordero Grant, great female entrepreneur, she was working at Victoria's Secret as the vice president of marketing. Mm. And she felt alienated from her own messaging, saying, all this marketing seems designed to appeal to a man's aesthetic about what is beautiful for a woman. But does a woman have her own idea about what's sexy that maybe deviates? And so she said, she started doing basically community sourcing of saying, what are some words you would use to describe your undergarments? And they said, they prefer undies more than panties. And like, there were all these little insights. So she's like, she tip, dips her toe in the water to create a few products that she drops, crushes her site mm. overnight. This is 2015. Launches what's called Lively, this line with mm. a totally different female aesthetic, mm. and sells it for $100 million yeah, five years later. I love it. Like, uh, and that's a proprietary insight. It's not a, it's not a business. So, you nailed it. So I gave words to these apps. What's fun when you have your own book, it's like a sociologist. I get to make up words. By the so- way, <laughs> but, it's, but I want to jump in and say something here. This is so important what you're teaching right now. Because I, I have a son who's going to be graduating college next year. Hopefully, we'll go play some golf afterwards. Hmm. But what am I going to do, Dad? What am I going to do? He doesn't really want to have a job the rest of his life, although he's probably going to have to get one to support himself because I'm not taking care of him. At least he's talking to you, though. I got teenagers. They don't want to talk yeah. to you. So it's good to know that on the other side, the other ask side, you for 2021, okay, you're smart and cool again. Okay, good, great. Okay, as long good. as you that do your job right. Yeah, trust me. I know the other part, too. <laughs> and um, I keep telling him, uh, Max, most successful entrepreneurs are not inventors. They have, and to use your terminology is a different term, they find insights. They find out how to make something that already exists better, or they find different insights and breakthroughs that they have. And a lot of you listening to this that have a job and you're like, man, I would really love to become an entrepreneur. I'm not going to invent an idea. Where are some places you can improve in businesses that already exist or insights you can find to do things differently? If you currently have a business that you want to scale, it may not be an entire new invention to scale that business. It can be insights into the marketplace that you're already in. It is really only from a real entrepreneur 
that that type of insight right. is revealed. But I'd say 95% of my most successful friends that are entrepreneurs had insights, not inventions. Now, I will say some of the big inventors are the really wealthy ones. Right. Agreed. Really mega right. crazy wealthy yeah, ones. Right, right. Elon Musk kind of type, sure, you know, type right, of a deal. Right. right. But for the most part, um, it are people that come on the trail with different insights. Now, you just said another term that I want to ask you about. What kind of resource has industrial psychology been in your business career? I know that's a bizarre question. I bet you don't know if you <laughs> no, ask love that. that. Yeah, yeah, but no, I'm well, curious you, about that. Well, anyone who knows, I get made fun of a lot for this because I'm being obsessed with it. But I'll mm-hmm. tell you the genesis of why. When I was uh, at running the New York Jets, mm-hmm. I had a pretty big job. And uh, the, the CEO at the time wanted to promote me, overseeing a huge swath of the business. But before we do that, we're going to have you uh, meet with these industrial psychologists. It's going to be an all-day-long thing. Now back to the anxiety triggers and landlord tenant court. I'd come this far and now I have to, you know, talk to the shrinks and mm-hmm. I didn't want to be probed. I'm tough, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember I had to go into a fake company that they had created called Panda Corporation. And the mm-hmm. CEO had just died that day. And uh, I had to take over his email inbox and they were going to monitor me. <laughs> I'm painting a very terrible picture. They're going to monitor my behavior for the next, you know, uh, 12 hours. And they had actors come in playing employees. It was like, Whoa. anyway, the whole thing. Anyway, the, well, this is the best part. The report comes back and it comes out that I'm in the top 1% of all executives. Yeah. Yay me. And of course, the, the owner of the team was like, this is, this is self-serving and tossed it. So I did all <laughs> that work. Count anyway. But here's the part that really, that, that, that I thought when I, when I was getting close to my end of my tenure there, about to create my own company, I thought, this is probably the last time I'll ever get real feedback from anybody. And I brought those same um, psychologists in to do a 360. And when the report came back, I was horrified that everything that I had thought I had concealed about myself was completely visible to anyone who spent any meaningful time around me. So there was this massive disconnect of me putting so much energy to conceal, manage, you know, show up a certain way, and it was on display. And I thought, wow, if, you, if I just give you, you know, $8,000 and you spend some time, you could give me the answer to somebody's wiring, including mm. my own. And I became addicted to the feedback. Mm. And so my entire career, I bring in, you know, my, my partners, my industrial psychologists, and they help in different ways. They help someone feel safe so mm. they could burn those metaphorical boats that have been holding back. Mm. I tell the story in the book, mm. an amazing story yeah. of a bartender from Ireland who yes. had come to the United States and had, you know, hustled his way into these different businesses. I had bought his cybersecurity business, and he was struggling. All, his management style, unwilling to face conflict and turn over staff that wasn't you know, appropriate for the job, couldn't do that. Mm. You know, so he was a classic martyr, taking everything on his shoulders, and it wasn't scaling. Mm. And at the same time, he was taking on incoming at home, mm. had a disabled child. It was all falling apart. And I tell a story in a book. He calls me one night and says, crying, I failed you. I- I'm going to... I'm going to resign. And I said, first of all, the call will be outbound. I'll make that call to you when it's time. It's not time. This was the moment I've been waiting for. I was like, let's go to work. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a transformation like this. I bring in the industrial psychologist. He goes ahead and goes, does the work, gets the report that's supposed to be private because it's very personal, excuses himself from the meeting, walks into a staff meeting in the next room and said, drops it in the middle of the table mm-hmm. and said, hey, you might want to read this since you already know everything that's in it. Mm-hmm. And by embracing self-awareness and facing his demons and creating this culture of transparency, within two years, he sells the business for nine figures and changes his entire life. So I know I'm very evangelical about the importance of therapy and psychology because I think the greatest breakthroughs are within our self-control. And we tend to outsource our judgment to TED Talks and you know my book mm-hmm. when we, the first stop should be you. Yeah. Right. Like, why am I not doing what I want to do? Why mm. am I stuck? Why am I blocked? And by you and I talking openly about how we struggle or mm. imposter syndrome, everything in the mm. book, it creates space yep. for somebody to look within instead of looking without. Yep. And psychologists, industrial psychologists can, if they're the right ones, can help you do it. Yeah. All psychology. You know, um, I really like you. I like you too a lot. Honestly, yeah. you, I watched your video. Those, you have to watch this video where Ed does this talk, 20 minute talk mm-hmm. about, about the difference between suffering and pain. Mm-hmm. That is one of the smartest pieces of content I have ever seen Thank somebody you. put out in this genre. Like, because I hadn't thought how to differentiate it. Mm-hmm. It's to, it is the pursuit of being uncomfortable, yep. but you shouldn't suffer in that process. Suffering suffer. comes from not accepting it, that that's mm-hmm. what's required. Yep. Suffering comes from not you know, taking care of yourself, all mm-hmm. these other things. 
and then talking about the prison of our own making. Mm -hmm. I literally watched her video mm -hmm. and I thought, you could have saved me three years of my life. I didn't even need to write the book. Thank you, bro. No, well, that was my book. I'm very you, efficient you, with my time. You told me that when you walked in. I did so because you. It, it, you had me in tears. Thank and I was you. like, this is so beautiful. And the, the mansion with the houses. Yeah. And, and I literally, I had this longing of like, could have given me three years of my life back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like you're doing that for a lot of people here today as well. And what the point though that you've made, and thank you for that, by the way. Everybody go listen to it. No, it's, it, um, it's true. It's, it's just one of my Thursday podcast releases. One of the, It's the first one. By the way, are you doing that because even in this context, you, mm -hmm. it's a little constrained because we're not getting the, yeah. right? That's what I, because I feel the yearning too. Sometimes I'm doing interviews and talks and I'm like, well, I want to give dissertations that I yeah, think can help. I think you should. I, th this show originally was that format. That's yeah. how it caught on was me, you know, basically every single week coming up with some sort of content or topic to improve your life in some way. And then it morphed into doing more conversations with people that could do that. And just for me, from self-expression, I, I want to be able to express myself, and, and I'm different than I was eight years ago when the show started. I want to start to express myself again. However, you said something really important. One of those prisons is not understanding why we behave the way we do. Right. It's one of the great prisons of life. So whether it's an industrial psychologist where you're doing therapy, where you just begin to pray and meditate and reflect and walk and think more about you and who you are internally, that's the prison we live in. It's like... Look, I don't love all the things I've learned about myself. I don't love all Same. of them. Yeah. But I'm really glad that I'm learning about me because that way I can contribute to more other people's other people's lives is really the, the is the game here. But becoming more self-aware, however you might do that, I really believe is the key to prospering in your life and it's just this taboo thing for some reason that I'm just going to consume things. Yeah. I'm going to consume a book, consume a podcast, consume alcohol, consume weed, consume a drug, consume porn, consume whatever there is out there. And somehow I'm just going to get through this life instead of starting to say, who am I? What are the patterns that I have? How can I improve? How can I begin to change some of my wiring so that I'm, my life reflects the one that I know I was really born to have. And some of that's not tactics and strategies. It's reflection and audit to use the term you used earlier. Sorry. Well, but maybe though, if we think about it, this is what there's, there's, um, there's an effortless, uh, philanthropy about your messaging and how you mm. put the the words out there. We talked about this when we first started. Mm. It's because your motives are pure. But mm. if we think of there's a whole culture around pushing consumption. Yeah. So there isn't an advocate for the self. You know, yeah, right. and and you are that. You, you are you are truly handing out information without an intention to force somebody to consume it, right? Like right. but right. most of the society is now this is sort of mm. you know a whole culture about doing it. I had cancer. I wanted um, to talk about this. Yeah, I want I want to because it dovetails to something you just said right now. So uh, for those who don't know, when I was 32, I had testicular cancer. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, my first reflex was concealment. Mm -hmm. Like when I look back at some of the behavior, it's so cringy mm -hmm. because all I wanted to do was make sure that those of the Jets didn't think I was defeated. Mm -hmm. And it was like an us versus them instant. And I was mm -hmm. on the brink of getting a big contract. And mm -hmm. I remember meeting my HR director on a street corner so no one would see, so I could change my beneficiary for my health insurance. Like mm -hmm. real crazy stuff. And then I go through the surgery and I go ahead and I, I now feel incredibly vulnerable. Testicle is gone. It's a pretty mm -hmm. violent you know, act, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, how am I going to represent to the team and everyone else that I am not defeated? There's a dinner happening the next day with all the coaches and it's a macho culture. And I'm like, I'm going to show up to that dinner and I'm going to roll out my new motto that I just <laughs> had made. <laughs> and I go to this dinner. It's in the book, but uh, spoiler alert. But I go to the dinner and I say, I have a toast. And meanwhile, I have a bag on my, on my groin, right? Yeah. And I said, I want to tell you my new dog tags I just had made, half the balls, twice the man. <laughs> now, I do still love that phrase because I think it's it does. Well, it's, well, it's, it's, it's owning yeah, it, right? I, right? I'm probably the only guy in America with a GED, a law degree, and one testicle. But, but, <laughs> but, but after, I, I reflected on that moment not as one of hero, heroism but as bad leadership because mm -hmm. I realized that anybody who worked for me is actually going to have to have a greater yeah. suffering or trial than having a body part removed, mm -hmm. or else you better suppress it because I showed up to work two mm -hmm. days later, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's actually terrible leadership. But mm -hmm. the point of the story is more, I began to yearn for the time when I had cancer and I would go to Sloan Kettering because I felt such peace and relief. And I was like, now why? I, did, I wasn't self-destructive. Why did I enjoy that period? And it was because it eclipsed all worldly concerns and put me in touch with my mortality. I was like, why did I enjoy the awareness of my own mortality? And I realized how much of my energy was about filling the void to distract myself from why I don't know why I'm here, where I'm going. Wow. And then I embraced this app that's on my phone. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called We Croak. 
So five times a day, I'm reminded that I'm dying in very eloquent ways from Socrates and poets from, from you know, it's always said differently and beautifully. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of that is when we get uh, in touch with our mortality, it actually brings us peace right. that a lot of the things we're worrying about every day don't hold up against the juxtaposition of, of death. And death is upon us eventually for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so it's similar to my point before about, you know, the work with the Vatican and whatnot. And so... I, I doing research, right? the happiest people in the world are in Bhutan, and they remind themselves five times a day that they are going to die. Whoa. And so I just wanted to talk for a second for anyone listening, thinking, ask yourself, how much are you actually subconsciously afraid of death? And when you actually confront it and be reminded of it, it makes you zero into the moment. And the present is the greatest gift where the happiness is found. It's where your spouse lives. It's where your children are. You know, it's where your joy is. Mm. And so cancer taught me that. And, and it, but as time goes by, you know, I, I drift away and the app brings me back. So that's a plug for a crazy app that I have nothing to do with, but I just have on my phone that brings me a lot of joy. One of my favorite things I ever said on the show. Right? Really? Oh, thank you. I'm going to tell you why. Um, I have, I, I'm a big believer. You know, all goal books tell you, begin with the end in mind mm. when we set goals. And I found sometime early in life, I had the whole heart issue when I was like 30. What was the issue? Mm -hmm. um, some plaque accumulation okay. already. And I had an uncle that had passed away at 50, and so sort of an alarming thing. And, uh, but I reflect on my own passing very regularly and, and deeply. And I, I have found that it is the one thing that causes me to be fully present now. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And, and that's why what you just said is so there's, profound. And there's no advocate for it. Right. right. We, like, even what we're saying right now, mm -hmm. I know that others have said it, mm -hmm. but we, that it's not said often. It mm -hmm. doesn't show up on Instagram posts. Mm -hmm. right? Like, right. Right. Like, that's why I talk about it, because mm -hmm. it's so counterintuitive, and I'm 100% convinced it could bring you so much more joy. It even does. you and I talking about this right now makes me, me I like it. This me, is fun. Me too. I'm present. I'm enjoying this interview. Yep. You know. And, and, my, and my blood pressure drops. Right. And a, a context and perspective. And by the way, I don't think about my death in the context ever of like legacy. I don't think of it that way. I don't think of like, what are people going to remember? Same, me? me too. Can I care less. I, I don't think about yeah. it at all. What I do think about is like, it just gives you perspective to what this time is and, and how precious it is and present it is and how really the things that we make into a big deal at that point in our life won't be. That's the benefit, though. Like, right. it's not, I don't know why there's no school of thought around this of Me saying, either. hey, if you want to deal with your anxiety, the number one thing is to actually contemplate mortality. You're right. In a safe, peaceful, beautiful way, yes. not in a morbid way. Yes. Like, not the pain you're going to endure or how, what will happen, or not legacy. Legacy is so irrelevant. It's almost, it's that so actually, actually feeds the wrong impulse because mm -hmm. you won't be cognizant of your legacy anyway. Right. So, who are you? Who, who, who's representing you? Right. You right. know, a statue they're going to tear down exactly. in, in 20 years. Exactly. So, but anyway, I, I'm glad we're talking about it. I am too, because let me say something to you. It's never been talked about on my show. I believe the frontier of human behavior and psychology, we're gone to something right here. And the next level of our understanding of this life will be a healthy contemplation of the end of it more regularly and a culture that does that more regularly. We would treat each other very differently. We should start that. We I mean, should. I, I, like we should, this conversation with the, maybe the reason we're in this room is mm -hmm. to start that because mm -hmm. I feel so passionate about it so and, I. and I need more friends. So, my <laughs> well, you my have kids are like, the alarm goes off. Right. <laughs> the kids are like, dad, you're so crazy. But you get a little gift of it. You said about your mom's passing. The, God gives you a little glimpse of it and tries to tempt you with it when he gives you cancer. God gives you a little gift of it when you have a friend you love pass. Or when your mother passes, or when my father passes, he's he's giving you that gift then. Because anytime someone else dies that you love, for a second, you reflect on your own death. It happens instantaneously. You almost feel guilty when you do it, but you do. And so there's these gifts throughout our life that should do, even a divorce. There's a part of your divorce, you're like, oh my, the end of my life didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to. It's a gift to just think about that time in your life. I had no idea we were going to talk about this. No, and, well, what's interesting, and why don't we respond to it when, when in, in those contexts when somebody dies? Because there's almost a degree of lecturing about it. Like, gather mm. ye rosebuds while ye may is a little bit warning, mm. right? It's implicit in this, like, you're going to die, you're mm. going to regret a lot of crap. Mm. Nobody's doing it in this context of, like, it's actually very beautiful. It is beautiful. It brings you very, first, you're sad, you know, mm. I, I don't, a very, very close friend died mm -hmm. uh, not that long ago and it was crushing mm -hmm. and and I, I just was you know so, but that it did bring me back to like let me honor him yes. by, by, by celebrating the day, the thing mm. that he no longer has. Yes. But we lose sight of it because that we don't have a culture that reinforces it. So if there were actually a culture of it, 
-hmm. it would be a lot easier because it would be within the rhythm. We're such outliers even having this conversation. So five times a day, like, let's just, everyone can just take a moment to recognize our death. (laughs) (laughs) It is a little bit extreme. Five times a day, you're going to die. You're going to die. By the way, just in case you forgot an hour ago, you're still going to die. The app is beautiful because the app, and I sometimes post them on my Instagram, Mm -hmm. no one even knows why I'm doing it. I'm just Mm -hmm. trying to populate the thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's always in the abstract. It's beautiful. It's Descartes. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's just something that it takes you a minute to unspool. Like, what's this related to death? I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, you know. Well, I think the other thing that it does is that it, it causes at least me to go, man, I need to stop delaying my bliss and happiness now. I need to stop delaying the things I want to go do, the memories I want to make. I got to stop delaying the emotions I'd like to experience. Because I just think, here's what I think most human beings think. They think everyone else is going to die. It's but not you, right? Except them. Wait, wait, I want to read you what's on my phone then. This okay. is my screensaver. It's just like, it just okay. popped up and okay. I was like, oh, okay. right. Life is not lost by dying. Life is lost minute by minute, day by day, day by dragging day, all in the small, uncaring ways. Jeez. That's what I'm saying. So it's, it's not morbid. It's not morbid it's at not all. Morbid. It's like, actually Thank beautiful. you, Stephen Vincent Bennett. I don't know who you are, but I, <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> I love you. I love him, too. And that's what my phone is at. What's used, the app called again? It's called We Croak. Okay, We Croak. I think i got to get on We Croak. <laughs> all right, last question for you. Um, by the way, I've enjoyed today tremendously. Me too. Yeah, Me too. I, bet, I bet you we do it again. Um, by the way, everyone get Burn the Boats and uh, go follow Matt Higgins on Instagram or anywhere else that you want to follow them. Um, all of that you've achieved. So from that little boy who's, I, I picture not the selling the flowers little boy. I picture the boy cleaning up the bubble gum under the tables at McDonald's. And I picture this little boy trying to not let the world know that he comes from this place and he's got this mother who's kind of disabled at home and he's caring for her and just probably afraid and wondering what his life's going to be like. I picture that little boy. And then the whole journey all the way to, Shark Tank and the Jets and the Dolphins and partnering with Stephen Ross in your business in the beginning and all the different things that you've done and now public notoriety more with the TV shows and your book out and the friends you've made and, and you know, Vayner Media and all the other stuff you've been involved with. Has it been worth it? I mean, be honest too. I, w- I want the actual honest answer. Someone said, is, is going through everything you've gone through to get where you are, is it worth it? Or is the path of least resistance potentially more worth it and do you ever wonder that do you ever look at someone who's led a much more simple life and thought to yourself wow i wonder i wonder which road was the right road and i'm curious because i think a lot of people think about those things as they're listening or watching us today Uh, the honest answer is i never question whether it's worth it Mm. except if i have to make compromises as it pertains to the kids it's my worst nightmare if my epitaph doesn't read therein lies a great dad i did the best he could or if they don't ratify that epitaph Mm. you know what i mean and Mm. and so that is the only moments because we all make choices Mm. i so desperately want to get that right Mm. but otherwise i do i feel like it was 100 percent. i feel like i'm painting i feel like this is what life is about and Mm. the striving and the perpetual pursuit of figuring out what i'm capable of it's always felt very natural Mm. and and for me like why am i here Mm. i am grateful that um i i responded to what i went through not by feeling like well no one saved me you know what I mean? Which a lot of people can feel like yeah. I had to do the hard work. I don't, my, the, my takeaway from watching my mother slowly die, and she died on the first day I became press secretary to the mayor of New York, which I put in the book to be like, there's no happy endings guaranteed, and no one came in and saved us, mm. is that I deliberately keep that experience very raw and unhealed. Like, if we started talking about it, I would, I would mm. weep. Like, mm. and I'm a 48-year-old man. Like, mm. get over it already. Mm. I don't want to get over it because it was the most important thing I ever witnessed. That if, if somebody had, had uh, interceded, she didn't need to die. She was a great person. She was very smart. I didn't need to grow up in squalor, right? Mm. So the ameliorating of suffering is the highest and best use of my energy, resources, and power. So I have been on a mission since a, a little kid, acutely aware that if I could accumulate that authority, those resources, but if I stayed connected to the pain, I would always be empathetic, and that would be a life worth living. So. Mm. To be honest, it's all quite calculated mm. because of that one moment. But that's mm. why that one moment must, must stay raw and unhealed. So the answer is, is it worth it when I get those messages now from people who read the book mm. and say, like, I know why you wrote it. I know mm. what you meant and wanted me to feel, and mm. I feel it, and I'm ready to do it. Mm. That feels incredible. Mm. When you're just talking, I was just thinking, so far, a life really well lived. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. I think yeah. so. Very yeah. intentional, at least, except so. except for, you know, the, the anxiety and the, and the, the, you know, but that's, we all have trauma. It's part of I talk trauma. also, the other thing I want to talk openly in the book about, I, like even Shark Tank having imposter syndrome on Shark Tank. If you saw the tape of me on Shark Tank, you'd say he's a natural, right? Just mm-hmm. objectively. They said I was, mm-hmm. right? They brought mm-hmm. me back recurring shark. Yeah. But I think that's a disservice 
You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I have a choice to make. If I pull back the curtain and show you how I really feel, now you don't feel less than or other than. Yeah. You can meet me there, yep. and we could go together and cross the threshold. Amen. My book is a, not an act of lecturing or teaching; it's an act of commiseration. Mm. You know, and so really good. I, I think it's a life worth living. It feels that way. The book, the book, I can't see past the book now, which is mm. weird for me. Mm. People say, "What's next?" I, I don't think there needs to be a next. Mm. I think this was the. This was the point. Well, I can tell you that it feels that way now, but that that is probably okay. Not the okay, case. good. I can promise you. <laughs> That's you probably have, fatigue, right? You, you, have, you have fatigue, and you have too much momentum and too much to give, and you're growing, and you're too self-aware mm. because in ten years there'll be a completely different dude there, an improved version of him sitting in front of me. I just hope we're both here in the ten years to have the conversation. Likewise, me too. This and, has been amazing, yeah, by the way. Yeah, I love today's conversation, guys. This is why I do the show right here. This is why I do the show. Conversations like today. It's why you guys share the show. It's the fastest growing show on the planet for a reason, and it's because of all of you. But it's also because the people that sit in that seat deliver in ways that is just supernatural when mm -hmm. we do this together. And Matt did it again today. God bless you all. Max out. Mm -hmm.